I'm Mokar Rizvi, and this is Scope. In the first segment of today's show, we're going to discuss a case coming out of Germany and that of the conviction of an Indian married couple uh, there in Germany for spying on Kashmiri and Sikh groups in that country. This, of course, on behalf of India's Foreign Intelligence Service, also known as India's Research and Analysis Wing, or known uh, by its abbreviation RAW. Uh, the last names of these people have not been given. However, they've been handed a one and a half year suspended jail sentence as well as a hefty fine as well. And this goes, just goes to show um, the, the nervousness with which India approaches Kashmiris even beyond its borders and beyond its reach, as well as Sikh groups as well. Let's discuss this a bit further. We're firstly joined um, by Mirza Saibeg, who is a Kashmiri lawyer who's conducted workshops, seminars, and public events around India and the UK on Kashmir and has lectured about Kashmir at SOAS in Oxford, Cambridge, and Westminster universities. In India itself, he's part of the Kashmir Reading Room and Kashmir Study Circle. He's joining us currently now from London. Mirza Saib, thank you for your time today. Um, what do you make of this case? Um, how worrying a precedent is it uh, that uh, this sort of spying is happening on Kashmiri and Sikh groups? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, first of all, I'd like to remind your, and your viewers that today is the 133rd day of communication blockade in Kashmir. And the communications blockade, the internet blockade in Kashmir is very linked to what is happening outside Kashmir as well with respect to this case. Because the communication blockade intends to engineer a cognitive dissonance about the perception of what's happening in Kashmir. And these espionage groups that are being engaged by Indian intelligence agencies try to gather information about what is happening in diaspora communities, how communities are taking the struggle, the narrative on Kashmir forward, and what Indian agencies can do to counter that and sabotage it to counter it by means of propaganda, which their uh, ambassadors or their cells in various countries will get engaged on, and to sabotage it by gathering information about people in the diaspora community, about who is uh, vocalizing, who is uh, taking these groups forward, so that when those people return to India, you see, most of the diaspora community people, they carry an OCI card, an overseas citizen of India card. Um, so they can, when they enter India, they can be targeted, they can be harassed, their families can be targeted. So it's basically a gathering of information on what kind of leverage the government can utilize when it needs to neutralize any person of Indian origin or any person in these activist groups that are taking the narrative of Kashmir forward. Uh, espionage is not something new. This has been going on for a very long time, but it has to be seen as an assault on right of freedom of speech and uh, right to privacy. Um, the, this, this, this attack on freedom of speech, it seeks to create an oblivion on the legacy of genocide in India and the ongoing repression in Kashmir. Uh, and there are various structures of violence that are being used to inhibit the nonviolent democratic discourse on sovereignty, on freedom. Uh, and India must be warned against the dangers of turning into a secret surveillance state. In fact, yeah. this is not the first time it has happened. This is the third time in recent years, just in Germany. You see, in 2014, Ranjit mm. Singh, uh, who was an Indian uh, origin citizen, uh, Indian origin person, who had been charged with spying for a foreign state. In 2016, a German immigration official who was of Indian origin had also been found of having given information on 45 cases to uh, the Indian intelligence agencies. Mm. And this is the third case. And just in the last month itself, uh, India, uh, there were reports in India of 1,400 activists having been surveilled upon by utilizing an Israeli spy software known as the Pegasus. And yeah. that software is only given to governments. So they were, the, this information came out that the Indian government had utilized or some government had uh, spied on uh, 1,400 activists in India itself. So it's not so, new. So do, do you, do you think? Do you think, in some so, sense, if I, if I may just cut in, do you some sense that this is a scare tactic and that at some level it may actually be working? is definitely worrying for anyone who stays outside India uh, and even people who are working within India on any kind of cause, like, say, the Bhima Koregaon activist, uh, uh, Arun Ferreira, uh, Sudha Bharadwaj, who, are all, who have all been surveilled and who are in jail right now. There were also journalists who were, who were surveilled during these, in these 1,400 cases which have been revealed. So it's definitely worrying. I don't think it's a scare tactic uh, because this is definitely a strategic move rather than just a scare tactic. 
uh, people who are who are working on Kashmir, uh, who try to vocalize against Indian repression, they already know what they are facing. They know that this is going to uh, be monitored. They are going to be monitored, and there are agencies everywhere. And like I said, you know, the Indian government is trying to find leverage to use against these people. Uh, you, in recent times, you have the example of Atish Tasir, uh, whose citizenship, overseas citizenship of India was revoked uh, because he had written something in Time magazine which was not uh, really palatable for the Indian government. Uh, so these things are being used as a scare tactic, but surveillance itself is, I don't think it's a scare tactic. I think it's a strategic move which is uh, intended to gain information about what's happening. But just two very important things that need to be sure. understood is that first, there is a clear pattern uh, of well-coordinated efforts by Indians living abroad, people of Indian origin living abroad and spying on diaspora communities. And secondly, that this is not information that is coming out because Indian activist groups or Indian courts or systems of justice have brought this to light. This information is coming out because foreign law has been violated. In this mm. particular instance, it is German law that was violated. In the instance of the 1400 activists, uh, it was US law which was violated. Because Indian law allows such surveillance, uh, whereas foreign law does not allow it. In Germany, yeah. it carries a 10-year jail sentence if you're spying for a foreign government. So uh, the, the present case where the couple has been let off, I would say quite leniently, uh, yeah. should be a warning for these groups to not use foreign soil for such such activities. In fact, it's, it should be a scare tactic for them rather for activists working outside. So then why do you think at the same time as the Kashmiri groups were being targeted, specifically in this case, of course, I'm speaking about, why were Sikh groups also being targeted at this time? And do you think that that sort of then goes to show that it's not just over the issue of Kashmir, but it's also that India is nervous about, about other issues as well, including, of course, Sikhs outside? Indeed. You see, it, it indicates the fact that India is quite nervous about any kind of uh, dissent. Uh, India is not tolerating any kind of uh, narrative which counters or is contrary to the state-approved narrative of events. So all uh, listeners, all viewers are dependent only on the state's narrative because that's the only narrative they would approve. I would say that in, case, in the case of Kashmir, the reason this is being done, uh, you see, uh, in, in the last few months, the issue of Kashmir has been highlighted quite a lot in international media. And the Indian government's actions on Kashmir will not stop at just the revocation of Article 370, which was a special status within India for Kashmir. It will not stop just at that. There's a lot more that in, the Indian government is planning. And therefore, these cells of uh, spies everywhere, of people who can keep a watch everywhere, are being activated. For example, uh, India has plans in Kashmir, which they are saying are developmental plans, where just in the last one week, we have learned that they have identified 57,000 acres of land in Kashmir for their projects. And this is land that they do not have access to. There is no legal right that India has to access this land without the consent of the Kashmiri people. So obviously, when they undertake these moves, there is going to be a backlash on the ground in Kashmir. And that will create some ripple effects outside Kashmir as well, because the diaspora communities will get mobilized. They will try to uh, leverage their uh, interests with with the governments abroad, such as you're seeing in, in the US right now, uh, there have been Senate hearings on Kashmir. And even in the UK, there's been a lot of mobilization of the Kashmiri diaspora. So the Indian government is preparing for that backlash when they start uh, controlling land in Kashmir, when they take access, when they get access to natural resources in Kashmir without any facade of local leadership. Yeah. So various networks are being blocked right now from Turkey, from Pakistan, from Malaysia, Iran. These networks are being blocked in Kashmir. And within Kashmir, there anyways is an internet blockade. So they are trying to control the narrative. In fact, just last week, uh, there was a report that was inadvertently leaked by the Jammu and Kashmir police, where they sent some information about drug peddlers in Kashmir to the media. Mm -hmm. But inadvertently, they had also attached a file which contained, which was an eight-page document of various accounts on Twitter and social media that they are monitoring. Mm. And after that, they quickly issued uh, a notification saying that that can be ignored. But it so I, I wonder, I wonder that if I'm coming right. again, I do. But I, I wonder, do you not think uh, somebody within the Indian establishment must be telling Modi or the likes of him that listen, we're going through such a headache. Why not step back for a moment and reevaluate this entire policy because it's becoming a PR disaster? certainly internationally as well. 
I don't think that kind of thought process exists in the Modi government right now. You know, see, see, they are already in violation of uh, international conventions, of in, of laws that India has itself ratified. The ICCPR, which is the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which India has ratified, this is in violation. This action is in violation of that. The United Nations General Assembly had passed resolutions on this uh, in 2013, 2014, where they expressed deep concern for surveillance. And in the last two years itself, there have been reports of on human rights violations in Kashmir, on various uh, interference that is exhibited by Indian government on Kashmir. But I feel that it, it reaps political dividend for the current government to show that they're very aggressive on Kashmir, to show that they have taught these errant Muslims, these deviant Muslims, a lesson in Kashmir. So it is in their favor to be even more aggressive and to be visible about that aggression. So they're not trying to hide the repression. You know, what they have done on August 5 uh, in Kashmir could have been done by various other means as well through yeah. the courts or through other system. But they have done it so brazenly and so openly to intimidate the people, to create this shock doctrine so that okay. we do not know what to do and how to progress. Um, so they, they want to create this display and show uh, a, and to create the narrative of a Hindu majority and government that they work for the Hindus in India and they do not care about the Muslims in India. And mm. one new tool which they're trying to use is the Citizenship Amendment Bill, which has just been passed, cleared by the President of India today morning. Uh, and that gives excessive power to the government of India. It has also made stringent uh, regulations, stringent uh, rules for overseas citizens of India. So they're trying to tighten the norms and uh, uh, basically the uh, national, the NRC, and the, citizen, the Citizenship Amendment Bill, both of them read together, are only going to depoliticize and disenfranchise the Muslims in India. So this government is trying right. to do all these things to show its population that it does not care about the Muslims in India. And Kashmiri Muslims are a different class altogether. They, they don't even see them as Indian Muslims. And even Kashmiri Muslims don't regard themselves as Indian Muslims. So, uh, so that, right. that merits all the more repression. It okay, so all just because we're running out of time, Mirza, Vic, uh, Mirza, I do apologize for cutting you off once again. Uh, just as a final comment, under a minute, if you can, please. Um, what, what are your final thoughts about this sort of case? Do you think that this is just um, going to continue at this point, or do you think that it's almost like the Indians testing the waters to see how the international community will continue to, to react to this? Because as you said, the sentence, to be fair, is quite lenient, um, and it doesn't seem like this will completely dissuade raw from continuing such activities? As I said, this is, not, this is not the first time it's happened. This is the third time in the last few years just in yeah. Germany. If you look at the Canadian system, for example, there have been uh, wise count, count, councils in Canada who have been ejected, who have been asked to leave by the Canadian government because they were found to be spying on uh, Canadian citizens. So this is a worldwide network. It's just that in some countries they have been caught and in some countries they're not. For example, in the UK, there isn't a visible record of them having been caught like this as they've been caught in Germany. So I'm sure it is going to continue by the Indian government and they're not going to be, they're not going to stop because of this. However, it, it's definitely a wake up call for them that they are suffering tremendously uh, across the world because this is just a move to stifle any kind of dissent. And in a democracy, a country that professes to be the world's largest democracy cannot, you cannot have these two narratives going side by side as a country that represses any form of dissent, nonviolent democratic dissent on a political question you cannot have that narrative go along side by side with a country that professes to be the world's largest democracy. Indeed. Well, we'll leave there at that. But of course, we appreciate time this morning. That was Mirza Saibeg, who was speaking to us there from London, sharing his thoughts on this uh, disturbing case. And as Mirza Saib there said, not the first case to come out of Germany, the third such case, um, as he spoke of. And there have been cases, uh, correctly, as he pointed out, in Canada as well. And there must be cases around the world, too, which have not uh, being brought to the spotlight uh, at this time, at the very least. But uh, what does this mean for Kashmir groups and Sikh groups in the diaspora? Can they continue their activities? Or will they now be scared to continue their activities vis-a-vis -vis any activities of dissent or otherwise or criticism of Indian government activities? Um, this is something very important, especially considering what's happening in occupied Kashmir, as uh, Mirza Saib there spoke about as well with the revocation of Article 370, the communications blackout, and the repression upon the people of that region. We'll keep a very close eye on that, of course, here in Sculp. I'll be back, though, with my next segment after this break. Stay tuned.
Welcome back, viewers. You're still here on Scope with me, Wakar Rizvi. In this segment of today's show, we're going to discuss the U.S.-China trade deal, which is possibly now moving forward. We are getting details of that now. Um, the, in this trade deal, uh, the narrative that seems to now be growing in some parts of the media is that, is that Donald Trump has bowed to the Chinese in some fashion, even though the Chinese will now be buying a significant amount more of U.S. farm goods. That's part of this deal. Uh, the other part of this deal, and the most important one, arguably, is the lifting of tariffs or the pausing of tariffs at the very least. Um, will this finally resolve this very long-standing now trade war between these two powerful global economies? That's yet to be seen. But there is this political narrative, right, um, especially in the U.S. establishment, which needs to now be overcome to be able to really resolve this and to be putting this to bed. Let's discuss that a bit further. We're joined now by Einar Tangen, who is a political analyst and an economic affairs commentator. He is joining us now from Beijing. Um, also joining us is Andrew K. P. Leung, who is an international and independent China strategist. He is based in Hong Kong, but he is currently visiting London. Andrew and Einar, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Andrew, let me start with you. What do you make of this deal? Um, the narrative is that Donald Trump has given in to the Chinese. Do you agree with that? Well, um, I think that, uh, first of all, you've got to understand the context uh, of what is just known as a trade war, because it's more than a trade war. Uh, this is a, um, a generational or tectonic uh, rivalry between the United States and China on all fronts. So it's not just trade, it's technology, it's military, it's ideology, um, ideology including Tibet, Xinjiang, Hong Kong. Uh, it's a 360 degrees pushback against China. So that's point number one. Point number two, as far as trade is concerned, uh, the perception in the United States is that uh, after China has joined the WTO, uh, China is uh, perceived to be gaming the system to American disadvantage. Well, but reality, of course, is quite different because uh, the major profits uh, from uh, China joining the WTO accrue to the pro um, intellectual uh, pro uh, proprietary uh, companies uh, like um, 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 uh, Apple and, 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 and so on uh, in the United States, uh, whereas the cheap stuff are made in China. Now, um, after a couple of decades, this uh, the situation has completely changed because yeah. China seemed to be eating Americans' lunch. Now, uh, as far as the trade war is concerned, you can, there are a number of issues there. The, the, the perceived um, uh, theft of intellectual property or the forced technology transfer, the subsidy uh, of state owned enterprises, uh, and all, also the lack of reciprocity in market access. Um, in other words, um, uh, China is exporting a lot more to the United States than China is buying. Uh, from the United States. But on the other hand, uh, the situation is not that simple because what China wants to buy from the United States is not flat screen television or television uh, or, yeah. or Nike shoes. It's the high tech, uh, high technology, but there's something America is not willing to sell to the United States. So you see in that context, uh, yeah. this kind of trade deal can only be, be a temporary uh, ceasefire, as it were, um, and indeed. Okay, so let, let me let, let me go to with, let me go to that, uh, Anar, right. with that, if you allow me, Andrew. Anar, what are your thoughts on this? Because uh, again, I already see the narrative building, and you may be noticing this as well in American media that um, the pressure is now on Trump to prove that he has, in fact, um, you know, preserved America's interests in this. And the narrative already seems to be that he is kowtowing to the Chinese. Let's look at this politically. So what you have is, have is Donald Trump has painted himself into a corner. He, he got very, very tough on China. He's uh, rhetoric. He said he was going to get an all-encompassing deal that would address all sorts of structural issues. But in reality, what you have is he's basically settled for a, a laundry list of things China is already doing with intellectual property opening up its markets. But the thing that uh, really strikes me about this particular thing is this idea of $40 billion in agriculture. Well, the, the fact is, uh, even at the height in 2017, China was only buying 24 billion. So I don't know where that extra capacity is going to come from. It just really doesn't exist. So this might be another Trump hyperbole trying to uh, get the farmers convinced that the good times are coming, when in actuality, they're probably not. Uh, China is reserving the right to buy when the price is right. And they said they'll buy more things, but there's no schedule. Also, there's this last problem, which is with enforceability. How is this going to be done? I mean, right now, it's just going to be 
kind of, well, we'll talk about it at different levels, but there's no, no guidelines. This isn't like the WTO where you have standards or rules or anything like that. So at this point, it seems pretty weak. Politically, expect the Democrats to be jumping all over this. They have been uh, throwing everything except a kitchen sink at China, on Hong Kong, Xinjiang, anything they can, uh, uh, Taiwan, to make themselves look tough on China, to push back on this Trump notion that you know being weak on China means you vote for a Democrat. So you can expect some payback coming from them as well. So on that point then, Andrew, on talk politics then, because doesn't it make more sense uh, for the U.S. establishment to want to work with China, considering there are so many bigger global issues that can be resolved in partnership with China rather than just creating an enemy out of it? Uh, if you look at it, um, both parties um, across the aisle, uh, not only the Democrats, but the Republicans, uh, they uh, rarely, uh, for the first time in many, many years, agree that uh, the whole country needs to be tough on China. Uh, so this um, uh, China scare uh, is very, very popular. Uh, it's informed by influential writers and thinkers and advisors uh, saying that, well, um, it's a 100-year marathon uh, to usurp the American leadership of a liberal um, uh, world order. So seeing that context, um, obviously, um, and the, um, America is unlikely to give in. Um, or, or being so, uh, seen to be soft on China. But uh, having said that, though, um, I think that the United States realizes that uh, it's not simple as that because the whole world has become interconnected, interdependent. And then um, even though apart from products, anything um, that you use, even if it's not marked made in China, China is embedded in, 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 in terms of components, in terms of uh, um, um, uh, logistics, uh, in terms of finance. Um, so you can't really uh, decouple entirely. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, because of the threat of uh, China's technology, um, both, I think uh, both parties uh, would like to be seen uh, to prevent uh, the dominance uh, of China's technologies, uh, for example, Huawei, 5G, and so on and so forth. Now, if you look at coming back to the trade deal, um, in the beginning chapters, there is a lot of um, 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 uh, 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 sort of words devoted to uh, intent, uh, mm -hmm. statement of principles. Of course, it's China's interest to, to promote intellectual property rights, uh, to open up its markets. And indeed, China has done already uh, recently uh, in opening its market to uh, insurance company and so on and so forth. It's very much in China's interest. But on the other hand, these chapters of statement of principle is, is touted by, by the Trump administration as a win, saying that, oh, now China is now bending um, uh, to, um, uh, under the, the, the threat of all these tariffs, uh, yeah. it's all um, uh, um, Donald Trump's genius. So I think that both sides could take okay. this deal as a win. Okay, so Anar, you know, I, I've I wondered this from day one of this of this quote unquote trade war as, as Trump begun it. Um, they couldn't all of this have been handled in a much calmer fashion instead of the hyperbole uh, coming from the from the U.S. establishment? I mean, imagine a lot of the things that um, that Trump would claim have been accomplished now under him uh, being so strong on China could have been done so in a very calm and collected fashion behind closed doors? Yeah, it could, it could have could have been. Uh, but you have to remember that uh, Donald Trump has a different, he brings a different style with him. Whereas diplomacy and business, they like to limit risk. They like to know what the future is going to be. They want to make sure that things are stable going in. Donald Trump is an opportunist. He, you know, he wants to sell you a building that's worth 50 million for 100 million, or he wants to buy a building that's worth 100 for 50. He does that by creating doubt, uh, confusion, chaos, uh, trying to get you to rethink everything that you know. So it's a, it's a very, very different style. The American people, uh, a certain portion of them, are reacting strongly. They think that he's in their corner. Uh, the reality, I think, uh, if you talk to economists, uh, people around the world, and, and many people in the U.S., they say that this has not been helpful, that it's alienated uh, our allies, destroyed the institutions that we created, and is now uh, about to plunge the U.S. into a massive recession. So, yes, it could have been handled better if it was handled differently, but... This is what the American public wanted when they voted Donald Trump in. 
And that's a good point, isn't it, Andrew, that, that Trump is essentially at his core, of course, a businessman. That's how he looks at all of these sorts of things. Um, but even as a businessman, he can certainly appreciate that um, American industries are suffering. I mean, soybeans, and I mean, the list is really endless. Even lobsters, I believe. I was watching a documentary the other day about how lobsters are not being bought now as much uh, by China from the US, et cetera. So, all of that is sort of just Trump hitting himself over the head with a hammer while claiming that he's doing better for the American economy. That doesn't really make sense, right? Well, because as the, uh, as quite right, right. I mean, uh, as the tariffs are uh, escalated to such an extent that it covers all products from China, that means uh, that would cover increasingly uh, the kind of consumer products that would hit the ordinary American people, especially Christmas coming. Um, and also they're, they're hitting the um, his uh, core um a constituency, the, the, the farmers and so on and so forth. And now with the elections, the presidential election coming up. So um, uh, Trump is under a lot of pressure. Um, but on the other hand, um, there's no way that um, um, that he, he could be seen to be weak. Uh, as you said, he's a uh, he's a very tough businessman. And then he's um, not only businessman, businessman, but he likes theater. You know, theatrics uh, is, is his name of the game, especially in the coming um, presidential elections. So yeah. I think that um, uh, all sides um, take into account uh, this deal uh, is likely only to be a temporary kind of pause. Uh, and the core differences between the two systems uh, would remain for a long time. I think we're going to see uh, further conflicts down the road, um, uh, either on technology or of market access. And, and basically, China is unlikely to give up its state-directed uh, system, because this is the core uh, of the um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the People's Republic of China's um, uh, strategy uh, is a socialist um, uh, country. So I think that you can see that these conflicts are likely to remain with us for a long time. Very well. We'll leave it there at that. But of course, we appreciate both Andrew and A for their time today and for putting this uh, issue into context for us, because there's a lot to discuss when it comes to the trade war. We can talk about tariffs uh, till there is no tomorrow, as well as uh, what both sides may gain or lose economically through this temporary deal or otherwise. But what it really comes down to is the political differences, the ideological differences between these two economic powerhouses. But it's also just about how the U.S. approached this entire issue, as I put to ANR as well. Uh, this all could have been done in a very calm fashion fashion, couldn't have. And this is completely undiplomatic. But as Inar also said, Donald Trump is a businessman. He knows what he's doing by creating those sorts of doubts, creating the very political risk which diplomats do not like to create for their businesses or for other countries, uh, because then there is always that blowback, isn't there? We'll keep a close eye on this. Is this is just a temporary deal or is this more permanent? That, of course, is the question on everyone's minds. I'll be back with my final segment after this break. Stay tuned. You're still here on Scope with me, Rokar Rizvi viewers. In this final segment of today's show, we're going to discuss Ankara, which has called initiatives in the U.S. Congress to sanction Turkey, uh, ones that disrespect Turkey's decision making, specifically when it comes to its national security. Uh, now, this, these sanctions have been placed on Turkey or will be placed on Turkey at some point, possibly because of its purchase of the Russian uh, missile systems, the S-400, as you remember, as well as its involvement in Syria. Uh, the push is, by Congress that is, for President Trump of the United States to take a much harsher line on Turkey at this time. Now, Turkey, of course, is a vital NATO member. Just days ago, Turkey's Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu had warned that if these sanctions would be placed on the country, that uh, the two strategic air bases, which the U.S. uses in Turkey, would be up then for discussion. Um, so let's discuss all of that a bit further with our panelists. We're joined now by Onur Erem, who is the president of Dragoman Strategies. He's also a political advisor, author, and has worked previously in the White House during the Clinton administration. He's joining us now from Istanbul. Also joining us from Istanbul is Andrea Stoyan Peradeli, who is an independent researcher based in Istanbul. Andrea and Onur, thank you both for your time today. Uh, Onur, let me start with you. Uh, what do you make of the U.S. Congress trying to push Trump to take a harsher line on Turkey? Well, I mean, it could be viewed in, in, in two different, maybe maybe even three different ways. Uh, number one, there has been, a, a, it's been a while since there is a uh, much of a hostile approach towards Turkey, uh, if not by the U.S. government, at least by the Congress of the U.S. That's, that's number one. Uh, that could be attributed to a lot of things, probably beginning with the uh, 
what it's what the uh, U.S. is involved with the uh, Fatah ter- terrorist organization. Number two, um, there has been an ongoing battle for a while, uh, especially heightened up with Trump's administration uh, against Russia, especially in trade and trade of also, um, you know, uh, military products. And then uh, there's all there's always a domestic issue. Um, I think the uh, the S four hundred deal with Turkey and many other deals with Turkey, as well as deals with other countries, are being uh, is is being a, a, a battleground uh, for the uh, with with the White House and the Congress itself, mm-hmm. especially the Republicans. So I'm attributing a lot of this to to the internal domestic uh, politics of the U.S. Mm-hmm. and this being the election year and there that, that the fact that there is a uh, there's a very big uh, disagreement on many things between the white house and the congress and this is just one of the battlegrounds that they choose to battle the, uh, the 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 president with but then andrea you know of course turkey is a vital member of nato and Mevlut Chavish Olu already spoke about the injured Lake and Koreshik air bases uh, that can be brought forth and discussed if these sanctions are placed now that they have been placed essentially by the U.S. Congress. Do you think that Turkey will uh, go forward with that warning? Uh, first of all, it, it's really interesting because last time we discussed, we were talking about the relations between Turkey and Russia and we were calling it uh, ice cream diplomacy, right? So today we are facing another challenge, the a challenge that has been, you know, summing up, summing up in the past, in the past months. Um, yes, NATO vital, Turkey is a, NATO, is a vital NATO member, NATO member. And this is a very important card that Turkey has in its hand right now. Um, of course, uh, um, as long as the sanctions are going to proceed, which I really doubt is going to happen, because this is a discussion that, as I said, has been having, um, it's been taking um, place for a number of months already, and it's not just about uh, the Russian missiles; it's also about the. Um, um, Turkey's intervention in Syria, which by, by the way is actually a matter of national security and it's uh, uh, protecting its border. It's, uh, it's a matter of, you know, uh, national security and it should be respected. Um, so I do believe that this is going to uh, be, it's going to be a really long term uh, process and it's not going to happen any anytime soon. However, if it does, if it's going to proceed, I'm sure that Turkey is not going to uh, have any problem in using the card that it has in its hand. And one of them is, of course, is the American air bases in Turkey. Okay, so then, right. So, so, owner, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems that Donald Trump does not want to go the way that the U.S. Congress is going. Uh, Why do you think that there is that difference of opinion between the White House and uh, other U.S. lawmakers? Look, most, most, if not all of the, uh, the, the members of members of the Congress uh, do probably do not probably understand what a, what a S four hundred is or why Turkey is looking for this or why Turkey is actually purchased S four hundred. Having been in the uh, in the in those round in those uh, circles for quite a some time, I could unfortunately tell you most of the uh, members of the Congress can't even pinpoint where Turkey is on, on the world map. So it, as I said, I, I think the uh, the reason of this this kind of hostility between Congress and and Trump. On this issue and many other issues is not because of the uh, the, the content itself, but rather the the fight the picking a fight between uh, between the Congress and the and, and Trump administration. It's obvious that Trump has not done everything in accordance with the status quo of of the Republican Party or the Congress itself. I mean, Trump has definitely his way of doing things, and this does not. Uh, go well uh, with the uh, let's pick a word to say the uh, you know with the establishment in mm-hmm. DC, and uh, so they're picking any in, in any corner they're picking any fight that they can, and I believe this is one of them. As I said, I know for a, I shouldn't say for a fact, but I'm pretty damn sure that um, none of these uh, not most of these members don't even know what S400 is or why Turkey actually ended up buying them from Russia. But then, uh, but then but to, again, to be fair, owner, it may come in because I think there's, a, there's an important point to make on this as well, is that uh, Donald Trump himself did those speak about, for example, the F-35, saying that it would not be compatible to have an F-35, to have F-35s um, as well as S-400s because they simply wouldn't work together. And then the U.S. was worried, as you well know, of course, the issue is that the U.S. was worried that intelligence about the F-35 would then pass on to the Russians. Is that a fair concern on the part of the Americans? 
it is not. First of all, I do understand, understand Trump's concern. He wants to, you know, he wants to sell his own country's product, which is understandable. But he also gave the credit to to Trump and I mean to President Erdogan and to Turkey, where he said, you know what, these guys purchased the uh, Russian product. I don't like it. I think they should have purchased the American product. But I can't really blame them that they they did this purchase. Uh, also, uh, it, it is a fact that. Uh, the S-400 is a standalone system. Uh, but let's go beyond that point. There's at least three uh, uh, parts of the world that we know the S-400 system is working uh, side by side with the F-35s. Uh, if there's any kind of, uh, you know, uh, any kind of theft of yeah. technology because of using the two systems uh, in, in w- within proximity, it's going on in at least three points in the world. So hmm. that doesn't seem to be a valid argument either. Okay, Andrea, what are your thoughts? Because I'm certainly not a military expert myself, but uh, you know, as owners, they're saying, and I, I checked on this, yes, the F-35s uh, are existing side by side with, with other places in the world with missile defense systems as well, which are not American. Um, is that just something that, that there's been hype created around in America uh, just to keep this sort of anti-Turkey sentiment alive? Actually, this is a discussion that I've had several times with uh, pilots, especially pilots from the U.S. Army, um, throughout my research and throughout my uh, my appearance in several conferences and seminars. Um, the perspective is that um, the this, this system is not compatible, and of course, is an intelligence um, issue that comes up here, um, together with the the incompatibleness of the of the system of the S four hundred and F thirty five. However, I would like to to bring up. Uh, something else that was already said, the fact that it's already working three three places all over the world, but also the previous versions of the S-400, the S-300, for example, have been working uh, together with American um, systems at the same time in other places of the world. So it's obvious that it is possible, it's happening. However, of course, this is a matter that uh, should definitely be discussed with um, people from this background, from people from military and especially pilots or engineers who do understand better the systems and the way they work. Um, as I said, the discussions I have so far come up with very different conclusions and very different arguments. Um, however, the past proves it very different and shows that it has worked so far. You know, one of the things that, 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 that strikes me is that uh, the U.S. establishment nowadays, at least, seems to want to do everything uh, in an extreme fashion, right? So it's immediate talk of sanctions. Uh, and uh, that's sort of very public negative diplomacy. And I don't even know if it should be called diplomacy, but rhetoric and, and, and these sorts of very negative actions, even towards Turkey, which would be, of course, seen as an ally, a NATO ally, a vital one, as I would put to both of you earlier. Uh, what do you make of that sort of approach to any country, be it Turkey or otherwise? I mean, that's not helpful to resolving any differences that two nations may have. It's not, but uh, you know, as as, we, as I uh, said before, the Congress for a long time, and there's many other reasons for this, uh, besides the Feta terrorist organization. But there's uh, many reasons why the Congress so hostile to, is is towards Turkey. But that's another discussion. Uh, on the on the presidential side, Trump is a uh, quote unquote very bullish type of a uh, president. He likes to uh, drive a hard bargain. He likes to play a hard game, but he's also a very pragmatic. Uh, leader, let's not forget. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see for the uh, end game. And just on, on the previous comment of Andrea, when I said three places working side by side, I did not mean the three NATO members actively using the S 300s. There is actually three points in the world. One is Baltic, one is Syria. I know one more. I I seem to forget right now where S 400s are actively used with an approximate of F-35 planes flying over. So I wasn't talking about the NATO members. All right, so let me give a final comment to you, Andrea. You can comment, of course, on what owner there said. And secondly, um, what are your thoughts then going forward on how this move uh, by the U.S. Congress will now affect uh, diplomatic relations between Turkey and the United States? Do you think Trump will um, you know, reach out to Turkey, that there will be more discussions, or will this now be more of a standoff? I do believe that, like you're, like you're not, the S-400 already got a, 
like already in Turkey. Uh, the deal is done. Um, I do believe that um, Donald Trump has been pretty firm in this uh, respect. He's been telling, you know, like it or not, they did it. They had this option and they used it, even if we like it or not. Um, it it will be uh, now is the time to to wait and see to look what is going to happen. I do believe that Trump is going to um, take an act and uh, do something. He might reach to Turkey. Um, even if you like Trump or you don't like Trump, he's been a pretty good mediator so far. Like he's been very um, pragmatic, as my previous speaker said, um, in the relation with Turkey. Um, and I do believe he's gonna, you know, he's gonna play a hard, hush card as well. Because at the end of the day, this whole issue, although although it is foreign policy, it's again a reflection of the domestic uh, internal struggle uh, of the U.S. So I do believe he will have to to play a very hard card not just for okay. for Turkey and for the relation with Turkey but for his uh, future in within the US policy as well politics as well very well we'll leave there and of course we appreciate both Andrea and owner speaking to us from Istanbul for their insight and of course providing context for our viewers um, this issue as both of our guests there agreed upon viewers is possibly more to do with domestic US politics the need for the US Congress and especially Democrats to keep the pressure on Trump just for the sake of partisanship really at some level and just to show that they're being strong uh, where they don't even possibly need to be this strong. They don't need to be this confrontational with every single issue. Uh, but they're yet threatening now sanctions on a NATO ally such as Turkey when they could have been talking to Turkey about their differences. And then this issue of F-35, S-400, possibly they're making more of it than needs to be made of, that Turkey can be spoken to directly behind closed doors in a much more calm and collected fashion. We'll keep a close eye on this because certainly this will have an effect on U.S.-Turkey relations if this does go through. As Mevlu Chavish Olu has already said, those two air bases that the United States uses and NATO use in Turkey itself, that can be up for conversation now. And that's a huge card for Turkey to play uh, in this standoff at this time. I'll leave it there for now, though. I've been Wakar Rizvi. Thanks for watching.